Ya Ali Madet, welcome to another Healthy Bites podcast. Today we are very fortunate to be in conversation with Dr. Shamiz Ladani, who is a consultant in paediatric infectious diseases and also an epidemiologist at Public Health England. Thank you very much, Dr. Ladani, for taking the time to join with us today. Good morning. Dr. Ladani, um, as a Jamaat, we are fortunate to have family and friends all over the world, and some countries appear to be affected worse than others. As an epidemiologist, are you able to shed some light as to why this may be the case? The epidemic, as you know, started in China and spread across the world very, very quickly. Now, the rate of spread in these countries will vary depending on how much travel went through those countries and how quickly they implemented their containment procedures. One of the things that's becoming very clear is the testing capacity of different countries varies a lot. So the countries that can test very quickly and large numbers of cases will have a lot more cases reported than those who are not testing at all. So most of Europe and the United States, for example, have very high testing capacity and they have hundreds of thousands of cases already. The concern is that in countries where they can't afford to do that, the third world countries such as India and many of the African countries are not going to be able to report COVID cases, even though it may be rampant in those countries already. Um, and Dr. Ladari, there's currently a lot of focus um, as to whether each country has passed the peak of new infections. Could you shed some light on why that knowledge is important and where we are um, as a country in the UK? It's not only about the countries, it's even more important about regions within the countries because the virus doesn't enter the country at the same time and spread equally. So you need a lot more knowledge about the areas where you live in before you make any decisions about whether it, you have passed the peak or not. Taking the UK as an example, it was London that was hit very hard very early on in the outbreak. And uh, cases went up very, very quickly while in other regions in the UK, they didn't go up as much. And so those in London were affected more than anywhere else. The reason why I'm saying that is that as cases start coming down in London, they may start going up in other regions of the UK. And so what applies to London may not apply to the other regions. In London, as in the rest of the UK, we are in the downward phase of the peak, which means cases have been declining quite quickly over the last few days. We are seeing less pressure on frontline NHS staff, on hospitalizations and on intensive care admissions. But that is only because of the lockdown and because people are staying at home. If that lockdown were not to work, then we would see an increase in cases very, very quickly. So it's very important to follow the government advice for your local region. Dr. Ladani, that is very interesting to hear. And there have been reports that Asians and other ethnic minority groups have been um, affected worse by COVID-19. Is this true? And if so, what can we do to protect ourselves? It is actually true that there is an increased risk of disease, of severe disease and of deaths in the ethnic minorities. Uh, that became very clear from New York where they have a very multi-ethnic society. There are many reasons for that, but the most important thing is that despite all the other risk factors, the biggest risk factor remains age. So starting from 50 years upwards, and especially 70 years upwards, the risk of severe disease is very, very high. So the older people in our community have to be very, very careful not to be in any situation where they might expose themselves to COVID until we have better treatment and prevention through vaccines. In terms of the ethnic minorities, yes, there is an increased risk. A lot of it was attributed to the fact that many of the ethnic minorities live in very impoverished, overcrowded regions, and therefore there's a lot more risk for transmission. Uh, many of them would not be able to self-isolate. They would still have to go to work and be exposed to the virus, and they have very big families. 
where they can transmit the virus and communities where they live in, where transmission can be very high. But more recent evidence does suggest that there are some ethnic minorities, including Indians and Asians, who may have a higher risk specifically for coronavirus. It's still very early days, but uh, we will find out more about it. But there's definitely an increased risk among the ethnic minorities, especially Asians and Indians. Thank you, Dr. Ladani. The current government advice is that individuals should self-isolate for seven days should we become symptomatic. But there, is there any evolving evidence to explain how long we are infectious for, even following the seven days? And can we get the infection twice? So that's a very good question because this is a very new virus. It's a very new infection. We have uh, learned everything that we have in just three and a half months there's still a lot more that we don't know about the virus. We do find that the virus can hang around a lot. So when you test for the virus in the nose or the throat, you do find viruses there for up to two weeks, three weeks, and even up to six weeks. But generally what they're looking at is the genetics of the virus, not live virus. People have tried to try and grow the virus out of the swabs have not been able to do so after seven or eight days, suggesting that most of the infectiousness is in the first seven days. And after that, there isn't much live virus that, that can be transmitted. But we still need more studies to confirm that. But seven days seems to be sensible in terms of trying to reduce transmission in the community. The worry about it is that you can start becoming infectious two or three days before you even develop symptoms when you don't know you're ill. And that is probably what's driving the transmission in the community. So it's very hard to control the infection unless we maintain social distancing and protect our older adults in the community. So in relation to the second infection, we still know very little about this infection. There are some studies that have suggested that the disease can there are some studies showing that people can have a very prolonged illness which can last several weeks because it comes in different phases. The first seven days tend to be mild with fever and cough and very non-specific symptoms. In the second week, you can go on to have very severe respiratory illness and many people fall ill during the second week of the illness. We know that the second phase of the illness can last for quite a while and it's very difficult to disentangle the first infection uh, from any second infection that they might have. What we understand generally about viral infections is once you have an illness, your body should recognize the infection and you shouldn't get a second infection. There is nothing about the virus that tells us that it keeps changing so fast that our immune system can't cope with it. So at the moment, even though there is some suggestion of a very few people getting a second infection, the general acceptance is that once you get it once, you shouldn't get it again. But these are still very early days and we need to do more studies to make sure that that's true. Thank you, Dr. Ladani. Um, we know vaccines can take years to develop. Are we any closer to developing a COVID-19 vaccine? That's a really good question. You may remember that uh, about a decade ago, we had the swine flu outbreak. At that time, we were lucky because it's an influenza outbreak and we have influenza vaccines every year. So they were able to just rejig the manufacturing to make a swine flu vaccine very quickly. And that became available within 12 months for use. Unfortunately, we have no coronavirus vaccines out there and none that have even progressed despite having the MERS and the SARS outbreaks. Because the outbreaks did not last very long, uh, people stopped trying to work on vaccines on them, which is rather unfortunate. So we are starting from a very clean slate. There are more than 90 different vaccines that are at the moment under investigation for coronaviruses. All are trying very, very different methods. You may have heard that the UK started the first vaccine trial literally yesterday, and we hope that we'll have positive results. The concern is that a lot of the technology that's being used is very, very new, and therefore we need to be very sure that the vaccines are safe and they are effective before we can try and give it to millions of people around the world. 
So it's moving much faster than any other vaccine program in the world. Everybody has stopped doing any other research apart from coronavirus research. The vaccines are moving very, very quickly through the early clinical trials. And the first one that shows any promise against protection in humans will be manufactured very, very quickly. You also have to remember that even after licensure, you need the capacity to make millions of doses of vaccine, and that takes time. So people are working in all different aspects of vaccines to try and make sure that when a vaccine becomes available, it can be made at a level where it can sustain the demand globally. So it is happening very quickly. Realistically, we are at least a year away from any vaccines that might be, in, might be licensed for use, and it may take a bit longer to get the vaccine to the people who need it the most. Thank you, Dr. Ladani. And before we draw the episode to a close, do you have any final messages to the Jamaat in relation to the coronavirus? Yes, there are a few really important messages that need to come across. The first thing is that the NHS is working normally. It is very important for people to use the healthcare system if they are not well. If you're having serious symptoms such as chest pains or you're feeling new symptoms that you didn't have before, please talk to a doctor, seek medical advice and get yourself sorted. The hospitals are designed to look after patients with corona, but most of them have completely acceptable capacity to look after people with other problems. As a pediatrician, I can tell you that we are concerned that parents are not seeking medical help for their children and children are coming in very, very sick by the time parents realize that their child is unwell. I would suggest that all parents be very mindful of their children. If they're worried about the children, please seek medical advice. Call NHS 111, call your GP, call your hospital, or make sure your child is appropriately assessed to make sure that there's nothing serious. It doesn't have to be COVID. It could be any medical condition. I have another message as well is that people are concerned about taking their children to the GPs and to hospital because they're worried that either the hospitals are not taking new patients or that they are infected with corona. And I can assure them that is not the case, especially in pediatric departments. It is important that parents get their children seen if it's needed. And more importantly, it's important that they keep up with their immunizations because what we don't want is for them to become sick with one of the vaccine preventable illnesses while they're trying to protect against an infection that is relatively mild in children. Dr. Ladani, thank you very much for making the time to answer these important questions for us and the Jamaat and continue doing the good job that you are doing um, we hope to see you at our next Healthy Bites podcast and Ya Ali Madad.